This is White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is Ken Geiger of Dead Door Unit, the label French Market Press, and a myriad of side projects and collaborations. Ken is currently based in Philadelphia, but has his roots in New Jersey, and is one of the leaders of a flourishing East Coast scene that is uniting newer artists and veterans. If you're hearing this, you're not accessing the episode through Patreon, and will only be getting the first part of the episode. In order to access full episodes of White Centipede Noise podcast, you'll need to subscribe at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. Ken also shared an exclusive Dead Door Unit live recording, which you can download if you're a premium subscriber. All right, Ken, good morning. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, um, I'm excited. I finally, you know, when I got your message, I was like, ah, fuck yeah, he's he's run out of people. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I like honestly, my, my list and my, my approach to inviting guests is really so like, it's really non- systematic and really like kind of scattered i have like a huge list of people that i want to invite and like a lot of times i'll just think of someone and be like oh i should get them on like and then like yeah i mean sometimes it's kind of like well who who might be free like now and it's like you know you you're like really active and and we've kind of got to know each other in the past no nah, not not super long but i mean like and 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 I want to know about that. I mean, it seems like I kind of in my mind see you as like one of the new, the new cats, the new dogs, kind of like the new controllers, the new, the new movers and shakers of the U.S. noise scene. I don't know how old you are, but um, you know, I kind of just thought uh, like you know, there there's the, the Blue Hell Fest just happened, uh-huh. um, which you know, I, I don't know if you were part of organizing that, but you know, you're kind of associated with that crew and you guys are doing a lot of stuff these days. So I just thought, you know, it'd be good to get you on just kind of like on a whim, but, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fairly young, 27 and, okay. uh, blue hell. Um, I gave, I'll say I gave suggestions. Um, but my days of, my days of booking shows are like really limited nowadays. It's not like, like that's one of the good things now with Jersey is that I don't, have to be the main resource anymore. Uh, that's all Luke Hendricks, New Grasping Machina. They do all that. Um, I just, I guess I, I kind of just, kind of just stroll in, be like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool, and then <laughs> walk back and go do my own thing. <laughs> how, how old is Luke roughly? I mean, not not that you need to tell everyone's age, but like, are, are are you guys all kind of mid late twenties, early twenties? Yeah, yeah, we um. Most of us are. Um, the only difference is that I kind of got into doing noise, um, I want to say like four or five years before the rest of them. Mm-hmm. So I'm definitely like, I mean, I've, I don't know, I've been around a minute yeah. Uh, since, yeah, 2016, I would say. Was yeah. Like that. KPG is like your your previous project that you recorded under, right? Which is, I assume just your initials and Correct. that's kind of started off 2016. Right. But it seemed mm-hmm. like the, the releases got more plentiful a few years later. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually found out about noise when I was like 13, Whoa. but on, um, yeah. <laughs> um, when, when so people just tell like, me that, I just I just think back to like what was I doing or listening to or thinking about when I was thirteen. It's like I can't really imagine that happening. Yeah. So like when I was when I was like thirteen, um, I was really into like still still fairly into grindcore, and um, you know the band that stood kind of like above the rest in that regard was Pig Destroyer, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, Scott, obviously prolific musician, Scott Hall. Um, he was in Anal Cunt for a second, which, you know, ed, that's like the edgy teenage boys dream band, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but from there, you know, like I, I go on the Wikipedia, you find like the name Japanese Torture Comedy Hour. And I was like, 
let me check this out. So the first time I heard that, I was like 13. And I was like, I didn't have the same reaction as like most people where it's like, oh, I could do this. I had the reaction of like, you have to be a genius to do this. <laughs> like this is, to me, it was just, it sounded like grindcore, but like the drums got taken out. There was nothing left. It's like, this is the most extreme level. And like, you have to be really smart to do it. So I kind of put it away for five or six years and then came back to noise and it's kind of been going hard since. How were you accessing, like when you said, oh, I want to hear this from Wikipedia, were you then like, uh, was it YouTube era where you could find that on YouTube or was it like SoulSeek? SoulSeek kind of like, yeah, SoulSeek kind of passed over me. Um, I'm actually very much a... I kind of am like a really tried and true like you give this you give a swing at the record in the store type of thing. Yeah. Um. So like, you know, that's how I got. I mean, even like, you know, going back to Big Sure, that's how I got like Prower in the yard, and then like I think my first noise record was probably one of those thirteen Japanese birds by Mersbau. Mm-hmm. Um, hated it and still do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like. I don't know, like, yeah, so I, I would say a lot of it was, like, going out and buying the record and then supplementing it with just Wikipedia or Last FM research. Yeah. And then you kind of, like, from there, I mean, shit, like, listening to, like, Last FM on my Xbox, I found out about the residents who were really big for me. Yeah. Um, like... Uh, shit like Mr. Bungle like Mike Patton is extremely huge for me another one of those gateways um, and then obviously I told you before and the Melvins uh, probably my favorite favorite artistic force of all time I'd say because they permeate so much more than just music for me do you feel like they're um, a pretty big influence in your work yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah without a doubt um, because like I kind of think that like like a band like that kind of gives way because their discography is like it's like expansive as it's expansive as all hell um and it's purposefully done so in such a way where it's like that kind of paved the way for following artists or following labels where it's like you know like oh I really dig like aesthetically what this band is doing let me just keep buying their shit. And then it's like, oh, well, they're on Ipecac. Like, let me, you know, like, you know, I follow Ipecac. Like, I just get releases because Ipecac put them out. And it's like, it's like you put on shit from like 31G. And um, I know we've had talks about, you know, before like artists getting on a label. It kind of feels like maybe they're going to do a release with that label in mind. But I never kind of saw it that way. I kind of that to me became sort of like a thing like where it was like oh you know like it, they just get that artist stamp of approval like mm-hmm. you know i why would you know a hand like a hansen tape is like oh that's doorway approved like mm-hmm. you know it's not i it might sound a bit like doorway it might not but the point is that you know doorway signed off on it and yeah that kind of starts back with like Melvin's and Ipecac as like the two kind of it driving influences. I don't really know that much about Melvin's, but um, do you see that as kind of like that, that, that release net, that kind of like spanning net of releases and, and label things kind of similar to like how noise stuff works. Cause in the noise you have like, okay, you'll find out an artist and you find, Oh, they've done a few releases on this label. And then you go to that label. Oh, this label's run by this artist and blah. blah. And then you kind of, you know, ex- you can kind of find a little, island or or kind of ecosystem of artists that are all kind of working off each other and 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 follow the trail like further out further out further out but it's usually kind of limited at some point too i mean when there's like degrees of separation but like you, you know you might find you might reach the outer edges at some point of like where these artists kind of go to you know like hansen's a good yes. example that they're, they're like mm-hmm. there are a lot of like labels that are kind of like affiliated or artists that are affiliated that have their own labels and you know yeah, I do find I I find it certainly to be um, because 
I find that like that band, I found them to be, they're always, even though I don't like everything, they're at least fearless in experimentation. Like they did a record last year of like, that was half kind of like throbbing gristle reinterpretations, kind of half noise-ish. It wasn't like the best thing ever, but like they keep trying mm-hmm. and it's kind of like the same with Ipecac. It's like, you know, they might've put out some shit, but like, you know, they put out shit like, like Phantom Smasher, which, uh, that's like an old, like James Plotkin and Dave Witty project, which like, that was huge too. Cause it's like that, it kind of teeters on that noise and rock music edge where it's like, I don't, it, it enters this weird zone and then you can kind of like branch off and see like, oh, okay, this these artists work with also like Amphetamine Reptile or like Hydra Head Records. Mm -hmm. And like you get in more and more into the labels and it's like just beyond the sound, you're like, oh, like I got to do my homework on like things like this. And it's like, you know, like I know it's limited in scope, the labels we're talking about now, um, just because, you know, they primarily worked in rock and metal, but like... um, I mean, Aaron Turner, Hydra Head, they put out Bermuda Drain. Like, right. I'm sure there was, yeah, I'm sure there was some kid who uh, was like a cave-in fan and found that and was like, whoa, like, holy shit. So, like, I appreciate still to this day, like, even if it's, like, I don't, I don't care about entry-level or gateway bullshit anymore. Like, they put in the footwork to make those things more readily accessible. Mm-hmm. So. When you're talking about kind of like the way the Melvins continues to try and, and do stuff that is maybe just new for them or new for just, you know, testing out ideas and, and kind of pushing their, their limits within their bandwidth. Do you see, is that similar to how you kind of work with your noise products? Because, you know, you have a lot of different projects side projects, collaboration projects, and you're pretty prolific. I mean, the past couple of years, you've been putting out a lot of material, different names, different labels, um, your own, your own label, a lot of limited stuff. Um, and I, and I, and I kind of get the sense that that's sort of like how you, you operate. Like you're, you're, you're not necessarily like concerned with it, like, perfectionism but rather like just like getting an idea out and and trying something out and then like letting it live and like it is that is that accurate oh yeah with without a doubt um i think that like you know i like this thing about yeah and i i I say like band like a band like melvin's or someone like mike pat and they certainly do stuff like that but that attitude came more like for me, that attitude came probably much more heavily when I met um uh when I met like the crazy Doberman and crew and like more specifically Kyle Flanagan. Hmm. Like if you want to talk about like kind of like turning point stuff, I think that meeting Kyle for the first time in Richmond was like like that was really important. Um, tell me about you that. Know, yeah, of course. Um, that was like 2019. I'd been doing stuff on, um, for a little bit. Um, none of it's exactly good when I listen back. Um, that's stuff I'd listen to today, but whatever. Um, but I went to Kyle's old place in Richmond. Um, and because I knew, um, I was messaging Drew from Crazy Doberman at the time. And he was just like, like, uh, I had set up a show, me and my buddy, uh, it was going to be me and my buddy, Nick, uh, Brancati. Um, we do a couple things together. Um, but he's always been kind of like a day one, like he'll hit the road and play with me thing. Um, uh, we had set up a show with Orion and I told Drew, that we were coming and Drew's like, you got to come through to like Kyle's house. Like we're going to chill hard. Um, Kyle had no idea who I was, but we get in there and it's like, that's the first time I see a four track. Like Mm -hmm. that's the first time I see like junk just pugged into a pedal going into that tape machine. Um, That's the first time I see fucking like wood glue records. Like there's this 
I regrettably don't have it. This crazy Doberman, like, anti-record that's, like, wood glue, that, like, for years, like, it mystified me how they fucking did that. Like, I think it was Kyle specifically who did that. And I'd always, like, I kind of would, like, message him in the years, like, past it. Because I don't, I don't want to, like, poke too much at the process, but I'd always tried to perfect it. I only... Like five years later, I I, I nailed it finally, kind of like the wood glue thing. But at the time, seeing all of those things was like, like holy shit! Like I've been doing, like I've been doing this all wrong. Like <laughs> you know, it's not just about like the blasting of the sound. It's like you know, like not everything is done on like the first take. Like you can like source recording exists. Like. Yeah. And then when Kyle moved to New York, um, you know, the, the, the bond just became like tighter. Um, I would go there, hang out, hang out at that God shop. And, um, you know, for someone who admittedly, uh, sucked for a long time, <laughs> uh, getting thrown into like that scene when those guys are all like, they're all hitting that stride, um, leading up the pandemic and like even a little during it was like it's like trial by fire like you gotta you know you're kind of like oh shit like you know i got out the game so it's like yeah yeah rig was always set up downstairs in my dad's basement like ready to record just like i i i, I fell in love like full on at that point The second edition of the Initial Shock Fest will take place on July 6, 2024 in Montreal, featuring Richard Ramirez, The Nausea, Heat Signature, Slime Street, Flat Grey, Skin, Parasite Nurse, Echthros, Deep Grey, Death Glaze, Murmur, Foul, Praxillus Succubus, Come and See, and Splinter Assembly. Advanced tickets are available now at initialshock.screamandride.com. An Aftershock matinee will take place the following afternoon, featuring Thin Mountain, Molena, Aaron Altamir, Green Mist, and John Vaughn. Follow Initial Shock MTL on Instagram for regular fest updates including artist bios and more. Initial Shock is presented by Scream and Writhe and Disaster Sources. Sponsored by Factor, Pizza Bouquet, and Untitled Zine. So you are from Jersey... You live now in Philly. You know, you were visiting the New York guys. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, kind of t- t- describe to me, if you would, a little bit about, like, how the n- East Coast scene slash scenes work. Are these places kind of individual, kind of separated islands? How much cross-pollination is there? And, and, and what, what was your participation at that time? During the formative years, it was purely just like it was. It was just like pure, like you know, I did it, but it was like pure fandom. I actually like just. I recently talked to Anthony Saunders at a gig, and he was like, you know, I'm like really proud of you, like because I remember like 2019, like you're just a kid who came to shows and was like, oh, you're just you know, you're just fucking cracking jokes and shit, but like no one thought you like. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, this guy rips. So, like, I was just... You try and take in all the shit. Um, as for, like, Jersey, during those formative years, it was nothing. Um, you know, uh, for a while, it was... It was just... I would say it was me, uh, Nick, who I mentioned before, and then... Uh, a third friend, uh, or no, a second friend, um, Pat McCarthy. Um, he does Despairish, and we also do a duo together called Hook 108. Like, those were the two guys who, like, I don't know how into noise they were, but they were just like, fuck it, like, let's just jam. Like, that's mm-hmm. sort of it. Um, and then, yeah, I think that back then, it was kind of good because it was like, I was in, I was going to school at Rutgers, so access to like Philly shows or um, New York shows was a lot easier, and I did kind of feel like there was cross pollination, 
not as much now. It kind of seems like now, like while I do live in Philly, a lot of my gigging is still in New Jersey because mm-hmm. like, New Jersey's popping off. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, I don't like to, I don't want to like be too much of a bragger, but it was like, you know, we built, like we built that shit up to the point where it's like, <laughs> where it's like, um, where it's like Matt at the recent end times was like, why the fuck did you move to Philly, New Jersey? Like da da da. And I'm like, I'm still going there. Like I, you know, like I can still be my, my driver's license still says New Jersey. So, right. uh, how far, I mean, how far away are cities like that? I mean, I, I know they're close, but I mean, is it, is it, is it easy to just kind of jet between them like and get home and, and like the same night or is it kind of still kind of complicated? I mean, I, uh, with the New York toll, uh, you, you gotta, you gotta really put on a banger for me to want to drive into New York. Um, but if we're taking, if we're talking time wise, yeah, they're both fine. Um, like from where my parents are, it's like an hour and a half to either city from New Brunswick. It's probably an hour to either city. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not, it's not bad if you grew up driving for most of your adult life, which I did like, yeah. You're living in Philly now. Um, are there, are you involved in, I mean, it seems Philly seems to have a pretty good scene too. Are you involved in that? Is there, is that pretty active? Um, no, I don't, um, no, no involvement really there. Um, I kind of think that I kind of think like what, um, there is like, I guess, I mean, the concept of a scene is like, you know, what what can a scene be is like such a wide open question now. Mm-hmm. Um, like in terms of playing shows and like chilling with like the pre-established release scene, not really. But, you know, I'd say within that there is another scene kind of like, I kind of think of it in the way like, you know, like someone like Skinner and Thomas, like those guys are connected. Like, you know, I, I I mean, it's easy to tell. Like, I hang out with, like, Josh, who does Confounder, and John, he does Fricker. Um, and, you know, like, Luke. Uh, Luke is kind of... Luke's a little more social than I am, but um, they're, they're, uh, they're definitely a part of what we're doing here, too. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, and so we kind of, like... There's kind of like a pocket within that where it's like, I guess, a little more of like the kind of like the weirdo shit. I mean, <laughs> you feel more rooted in in Jersey. A hundred percent, a hundred. It's kind of like, um, um, yeah. I mean, it, it it's easy. It's still easy to drive to, um. I, you know, you, yeah, you, you feel some sort of way when you came up, when you started in one region. And I still feel that way about New Jersey because it's like now that it's popping off, you know, um, you kind of take a step back and be like, yeah, like, you know, this, this came from nothing. It, you know, there wasn't anyone here but me. And, I want to kind of still celebrate that now that it's happening. I want to, you know, help celebrate it. And, uh, I, I feel the passion there still more than trying to just do something again in Philly. Um, so do you feel like East coast scenes are kind of, uh, guarded or, or clicky? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say so. Um, you know, that, and that can be for a myriad of reasons. Um, uh, I would, you know, I kind of think what separates New Jersey with the difference is putting on for just acts we like rather than like, you know, is it, 
are you know are they chill are they this are they that I, I there's no vetting process as far as I'm aware um anyone who has that I mean you know that that that's that's your uh that's your prerogative but at least from my outside perspective it's kind of like it's it kind of reminds me of like being in high school and hearing like the stoners who talked about like how sick their fucking bong rips were last night and like you know like joey did this trick and like it's like it's funny it's funny and entertaining to that crowd but like you know i derive no value from it um and i'm just kind of like you know what do your thing um i'll come to a show if it's really popping off but otherwise it's like I believe a lot in what we're doing with our own stuff and like what my friends are doing. And I'd rather just continue working on that mm-hmm. rather than trying to fit into whatever idea another scene has going. Um, tell me about dead door unit. Um, you know, cause KPG was your project leading up to a certain point that I think around what 2022 dead door units seem to kind of take over and you've been really active with that. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, in, I think in 2021, I made the first tape. It was like October. I made the first tape and, um, which would be trap doors, forbidden tunnels. Um, which, uh, you know, at the time, I mean, I, Really loved shit like Shredded Nerve. Really loved a later era skin crime. Kind of wanted to capture those vibes. Um, and when I finally recorded that tape, I was like, I was like, whoa, like, you know, the vibe, the vibe is so different. The everything, like, it's kind of a little more, it felt a little more unique than what I had been doing in the past. Like it kind of finally felt like that moment of like, I made it like I made the good record. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was also like, you know, trying to go to someone and be like, Hey, put out my debut tape after years of sucking (laughs) is not going to work. Uh, and at that point I'd kind of already been doing stuff. Um, on my own. So I was like, well, let me, let me run more tapes than I usually would. Let me like formally just, you know, let me drop the project. Let me start this, like, let's kind of make it official. And, um, you know, since then it's, it's definitely changed. Um, the approach, the aesthetic, it's, I'm always just trying to try something new, but I don't ever think it's not like, it's not like a controlled bleeding thing where it's like you're at risk of going from harsh noise to free jazz. You're not going right. to get that. Sure. I'm definitely, definitely going to hang out in some similar zones. Um, and yeah, you know, um, I, I, I'm just really grateful about the current like response that people have given to the project and like, it feels weird when people give a fuck about anything that I did, but it feels good though. I mean, it, it, it's, it, I know it does. And, you know, especially when you've been doing it for a while and when you, yeah, like that moment when you kind of realize, okay, what I was doing back then, I was kind of just, I wasn't sure about it. I mean, maybe at the time it felt, it felt fun, but you know, when you get to that moment where you're like, "Oh, okay, now I'm, now I'm at least confident about it. Like now I know it's good. Like it, it doesn't mean that everyone has to love it and eat it up, but now I know, like I can say confidently that it's good. I'm not like, I'm not like unsure of it anymore. You know? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I definitely, I definitely feel that, and um, it's kind of like. It's it's also a little weird that you can just you know there's that old like there's there's like those old jokes of like ex artists could fart into a mic and their fans would buy it, um, 
I've done things before where it's like, I, I'm not going that far, but like, I've definitely done like, like when I did my first two live shows, it's like, I made a quick tape, put in some wood and like, people were just like, I need this tape. And it's like, <laughs> and I was like, sorry, brother, it's all out. Um, <laughs> but it's like, even that, like looking back, like, eh, that one's okay. But right. like, like it is weird that like someone would be way more excited well i think yeah like i think putting in the work and putting showing the enthusiasm and i think that's one thing for sure is that you show a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of work that you put into you know your involvement your music everything like uh, just over the past couple of years like you've become like a very present guy and like i well, like i haven't been up close and like involved super personally but and so I didn't know like where you know exactly which city you're operating in, blah 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 blah, like the specifics. But I've been clearly like seeing like okay, you're doing a lot of stuff, East Coast, um, you know whether that be Jersey or Philly. I you know I didn't know exactly, but you know, and I think that that builds up and and lends itself offensively to being people being like, yes, this is this is something I want. Like, and then you do the crazy packaging and then it's like, Oh hell yeah, I want this. <laughs> like, so, 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 so tell me about the, uh, the, the, the label that you, that you do now and, and French market press. I mean, you do pretty, pretty small editions and usually pretty, you know, elaborate handmade packaging. Yeah. Um, so before I get into all of that, I just want to remember, I just want to point this out. Um, while you do state people are enthusiastic, I will have to say the one time there was a really unenthusiastic was um, Armageddon Shop in Providence was straight up like, no, nah, we don't take that. No, nope, no, nope, that they're like, we don't do the bizarre, we don't do the extreme packaging. And I was, <laughs> I was like, that's like that's totally understandable. But I love just like the immediate like they knew what was up. They're like, nope. Yeah. Don't care if it don't care if it'll sell, don't care, like <laughs> but um French market, um uh I could probably probably send a picture or something after the fact. French mm -hmm. market was um it was started in my dad's basement during the pandemic. Um and for anyone wondering, it is named after a coffee mug that my dad got from New Orleans. Um <laughs> And I used to drink, I used to drink like rail coffee every single morning out of it in the height of COVID and would just go downstairs, listen to noise, record noise, like make all this stuff. Um, and, you know, um, I had done a label like prior to that. It wasn't really, it kind of felt like going through the motion because like you're ordering tapes from Knack, you're the J cards, like I don't do J card design. Like I didn't have a part in that. Like it, it felt like all I'm just doing is I'm being the fucking bank. Right. Like that doesn't right. interest me at all. Like, um, so I kind of started French market as like the, like the, the hidden label sort of thing. And I was really into, I would say like the three labels that kind of got me interested in doing things was, um, Definitely American Tapes, um, Triple R, meeting Ron and, you know, kind of learning from Ron has been, um, like, massive for me. And then um, probably, like, seeing, again, going, like, New York, like, Dead Gods and, like, the Kyle Flanagan, like, his exclusive tapes and CDRs, like, that stuff, like, that felt real to me. It's, like these are handmade things. So French market started in my dad's basement. Um, it was literally any C nineties that I could get off Facebook marketplace or mm -hmm. anything like that. Like any leftover junk tapes. It's like, you know, this is the tape, this is what's going on. And then the packaging, it's like, um, you know, spray paint, Obviously, it's always been spray paint, but then, like, if I can find something weird, like, um, like last day with my garbage is one of the first six. Um, I'm constantly fucking reminded of the first six by collectors and shit. 
um Why? where it's like because that was when like nobody cared about the fucking label and i was mm. literally just like giving shit to friends um and like though like i can probably name you everyone who has one of those tapes off the top of my head it's so limited but like that shit like like last day with my garbage was literally just packaged in any piece of garbage i could like cutting soda bottles and sticking the tape in it um <laughs> it was just like doing shit like that because it's like well who cares like it's not like i'm gonna be launching a, a big cartel um but that's kind of like where it all starts and then you know it dies for a couple years and finally in 2023 i'm like i got a little bit of money i want to restart a label a lot of it was because um uh caleb from flesh shuttering had given me a tape years ago that i completely dropped the ball on putting out um and i knew i didn't want to go back to my old label um because it was meant for that but i'm like i could put it out under french market press like fuck it let's do that let's do dead door unit oh master grave services just recorded its first tape let's do that that's mm -hmm. the batch there we go and then like you know uh now it's kind of like the idea is to balance it's kind of to balance like the old style and the new style it's like i want to make like tapes that people like i don't like not every tape now is going to be like a fucking like you know, this is, this is chained together to a, uh, this is chained together to a dead fish. And like, <laughs> I made 50 of them. That's, that sounds like a lot of fucking work. So yeah. there's kind of like the main line where it's like, I'll do tapes in a certain style. That's not like too pressing, but it relates to like what I think is fitting for the tape. And then I have another thing called, uh, the negative series where it's like, I never had a cattle, uh, I've never seen a label do it before. Like they actually count backwards in the catalog number. So I think I'm up to like negative four right now. Those ones are a little more like the extreme, like, uh, like the most recent one was, um, for last day of my garbage was, uh, I took it, I put it in a note card. Then I put it in a piece of like garbage again, and then I spackled over it, um, just because, like the whole con the whole concept of the tape, which was called "Hell Is Other Garbage," is like to listen to the garbage. You have to break open the garbage and create more garbage. So you're constantly in a cycle of garbage. Um, so it's like this stuff like that. I still kind of keep it alive. Those titles you can only get if you email me. Um, although I did. I did relent a couple copies to Taylor just because he yeah. is, uh, he's, he's been massively supportive, um, since I started back up. So, um, but yeah, that's sort of like what French is doing now. We talked about this one time at like, I think the, the white Samuels video party. Um, and I was kind of giving you flack about like, Hey, why aren't you getting your copies to, you know, European district to Statuata or whatever. Um, but you know you do decidedly small batches and you know what what are your thoughts on that because that kind of does go back and reminds me of the i think the particularly east coast thing right now because that's where there's really a lot of seems like that's where a lot of the most activity is in the united states maybe i'm wrong that just that just kind of occurred to me but maybe i'm wrong but east coast has a lot of activity and you know a lot of cities kind of close to each other it's maybe similar to europe like one thing about Europe that blew my mind moving here is like everything is close. It's like even to get to another country, another city, it's maybe just, you know, a few hours. Whereas growing up in the Midwest, it's like there's none of that. It's it's far. Um, yeah. but East Coast, you know, it can have these really centralized scenes that really just kind of are self-sustaining and, and just kind of serve themselves and each other and like make these small edition tapes or these small labels that just kind of just exist for those people around that, those group of friends. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm a fan of, I'm a, a proponent of larger editions that can get out to the world, but there's also something to be said for these kind of like intimate, just 
for for this actual physical space type releases or labels you know how do you see the label in terms of those different approaches um so i'll i'll address the europe accusations real quick <laughs> um i'll address any label accusations real quick it's not that i'm not like it's not that i'm trying to create this little exclusive club and be like you know like ha ha like you know, like, I'm not pointing and being like, oh, haha, Japan doesn't get my fucking tapes, like, whatever. It's it's entirely because the nature of tapes right now with labels is that people trade and, like, I'll trade one time. I'll trade one time with a label if they have something I really like. I'll trade, I'll do it. I like getting stuff personally. I love having records but I'm not going to have my hand forced and do a distro. Um, it's, it, uh, you know, props to you, props to Taylor, Vilho, whoever does it. Um, Chris Groves, too. Just sent a package to Chris, Chris Groves. Kudos to everyone who's done it. It's not what I like to do. Um, I, because I don't want to get home from my day job or my night job. And then kind of think to myself, oh, fuck, I got to pack and go to the mail tomorrow. Or, there, or, you know, someone out in, like, fucking Long Beach, California is going to think I'm an asshole. Right. Um, like, I, I... But that being said, on the small edition stuff, um, it's just... It, it kind of came out of the whole idea that... I'm doing a label where I'm taking... I'm taking my weaknesses and utilizing them to my advantage. Like, I can't do Photoshop. Tried GIMP once, horrible at it. I'm horrible with that graphic design shit. So what I'd rather do is just, you know, go that extra step, kind of do the elaborate packaging, because it's shit that I like, without a doubt. Um, but, like, it kind of also harkens back to uh, there's this... There's this great uh, John Olson quote from an interview he gave a few years ago. He's talking about running American, and he's like, if I had to think about it too much, I just didn't do it. And yeah. I'm kind of on like a, a similar wave where it's like, I don't want to think about it too much. I kind of, I give my idea to the artist. I'm like, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? If they like it, that's cool. If not, we work on it a little bit. Um, I'm happy a lot of artists trust what I'm doing. Um, but like, I guess to me, like the small edition stuff, it, it is cool. Um, I've thought of course of like, I've thought of stuff, of course, of like repressing things, but I always go back in it because it's like noise to me at times sort of feels like it's like choose it is like a choose your own adventure thing like certain artists like those are the ones that really like those are the ones that struck a chord with me a lot is like like any of that midwest stuff like um wolf eyes or like hospital or bastard noise it's like you're not gonna get everything unless you know you're like hyper collector um but like is that really the point like right. is the point to hear the point to really hear everything like i don't i don't i'm not a i'm not saying i'm not saying that out of like the idea that like that edition of seven tape might not be good it's more that it's like i like an idea of being an artist where a lot of people have a lot of different interpretations of me so if you only know dead door through like the bigger run stuff that's great like that that is just as important as the limited edition of five that I put out. Like, it's all part of the same story, but you're getting a different idea of what I'm doing. Um, and um, I think I've also fucked up and made myself intentionally hard to do any reissues because a lot of that stuff's on C90s and I'm not doing double, you know, no yeah. label, no label is going to be like, oh, a double CD reissue. Right. Get the 
fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> what would be something of your limited releases of Dead Door Unit, either on your own your own label or that have come out on other labels, um, that if someone were to be like, let's reissue something on an LP. You don't mm-hmm. think about the, the, the actual length of the, the, the actual like, but just like, like one recording that like, you're like this, I want to preserve and have people really hear it. What would be the one? Um, I know you just came out with a, a new CD recently, which is very good on, on tribe tapes. I mean, that's, that's one that'll be heard by a lot of people too. I mean, but I'm just thinking of like kind of your pack, your past catalog. Cause you do a lot of really quick, like I said, you're for prolif- prolific, limited to five to seven stuff. I mean, what of that stuff are you like, this should, this could be an LP and I would be like, fuck yes. Well, Oscar, you present an, you present an interesting conundrum because I don't like listening to LPs. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, a CD, cool, but yeah, you know, no, <laughs> I'm joking though, but, um, I'm saying a I'm, CD or, or I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I picked that because LPs are the more, you know, they require money to make more right. sort of the CD, but like a CDs are getting less and less expensive where it's like reissuing stuff on CD is less of a commitment than it used to be. Whereas like if someone were to be like, I'm going to commit and invest some money into like making reissuing something. So An LP. CD or LP. Yeah. There is one that stands out, which is, um, uh, because you know, I'm a f- fucking psycho and I'll listen back to my old shit. Um, the second tape I did under a project called Remember a Day, mm-hmm. um, that was really awesome. Uh, it's kind of like, it kind of comes from that it, basement era where like anything around I'd pick up, like I had this old, uh, I had some old like percussive toys that I would just loop or like my guitar. Um, I'd play around with that stuff. And that's like, that could be on like one LP. That's cool. Um, The whole point of that project was, like, the tape was recorded, packaged, and done in a day. Um, But, like, I like a lot of the old, like, that's probably one I would pick above all the rest. Um, Like, I I enjoy, I enjoy when, like, little weird side projects get the light. Like, um, yeah, like, I mean, One Dark Eye would, like, I I like, I kind of like One Dark Eye a lot more than most macro stuff if i'm sure. being honest why is it important to be busy and prolific for you i get the sense you like you're a very busy guy you stay very busy and you stay prolific you're doing lots of stuff all the time you know you mentioned where you work two jobs you are involved with shows you're recording a lot you're releasing a lot why is that important for you um i think it's important just like it it comes from like the young age with my parents instilling very early on um like work ethic make sure you're staying active do stuff um and even just like get it like get it right if you're going to do stuff like um I'll blow up my dad's spot for a minute and tell a story of like one of my first jobs was like cutting my neighbor's lawn And, um, he, my dad drove by like an hour after I'd finished it. And he, he was like, he's like, Hey, um, I saw Mr. Miller's lawn cut and, um, that it, no, we're going back. Like, you're going to go back and you're going to like, you're going to, you're going to trim the edges. You're going to do this again. Um, and you know, I, I complained the whole way, but like, um, cause I was like, he said, it's fine. He said, it's fine. And he's like, no, you're going to like, if you're going to do something, you're going to put in the quality work and you're going to do it. And, um, that kind of thing has just permeated with me since like, if I didn't want to do the label, I would not do the label. Um, if I didn't want to do like any of the other activities that I do in my life, like if I didn't want to work a security job, I wouldn't work it. Um, like any of my other activities that I do outside of like noise and shows, like I wouldn't do this stuff if I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And also it's just like in my downtime, um, I like to lay low, like very low. So it is also as much as it is about hardworking and just having that 
in me. It, it's also just like if I wasn't doing stuff, I would just be inside watching movies and playing video games all day. I, you yeah. wouldn't hear from me anymore. Yeah. I, um, You're also a big weightlifter, and you know I've uh, I, I asked people on Patreon about questions they had for you, and a few people brought that up. You know, wanted to know about that. Uh, Sister Rossi on Patreon asked, uh, asked him about powerlifting. How, when, why did he start? What's his training cycle? What made him start competing? His takes on hypertrophy versus strength, favorite lifts and goals. That's, of course, a lot. You could probably talk about that all for an hour. But but, but tell t- tell me about your your hobby. Uh, you know, not, not just a hobby. I mean, weightlifting like that seems, you know, you got to take it seriously you 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 got to adjust your diet you got to adjust your schedule you got to be you know you got to be committed to it. so tell tell me about that yeah um i you know a year before all of this took place um i'll say before we get into that jim slacking and i when we did our like weekend tour together um we were talking about like you know what would what do you what, like? I think it was like him that brought it up. Like, what, what do you think you would ask you about if you if you ever got an interview on White Centipede? And I was like, the way you lifting would be brought up. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Um, I would have brought it up. But, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've admired that for a long time, just seeing you online doing that. And then, but of course, that was like big, yeah, big, big on the minds of the people, you know. Yeah. Let me. Um. Yeah. Let, let's break it down real quick. Um. I got into weightlifting just like. Um stereotypical story you don't you know the chubby kid in middle school you don't want to kind of feel some sort of way you, you know that it, it, it's a classic tale but i got into it um, you, wanted be, you wanted to be big you want it was like exactly and like pumping iron um, was, i mean have you, you've seen pumping iron i'm sure the, no, movie? the documentary no i haven't i actually oh. got in so i got really committed like because you know that push and pull of like you know, you want to be punk rock, but you want to like pump iron. Yeah. Um. But then you see, but then I saw a picture of Henry Rollins, and I was like, yeah, okay, you can do both. Like, if you'd like to continue this episode, you'll need to subscribe at Patreon.com/slash White Centipede Noise. Once you do, you'll get access to the full version of this episode, as well as WCN TV episodes and a wide range of bonus noise content. In the full version, we talk about Ken's strongman training his relationship with certain noise veterans, writing reviews for Rocker Magazine, and much more. Ken also shared an exclusive Dead Door Unit live recording, which you can download if you're a premium subscriber. White Centipede Noise podcast is made possible entirely by scene support. You can support by subscribing at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. 